Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Folks, hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. For this week's episode, I'm joined by someone who seemed to have it all. She's a model and TV and radio presenter, but then decided to leave it all behind to backpack around the world for two years. In that time, only by leaving it all behind did she find true freedom and happiness, which she's chronicled in her best-selling debut book, Jump. Daniela Moyles, welcome to Real Health. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So congratulations on the book doing so well. Fantastic to hear. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, really, really unexpected um, and slightly disconcerting. I think it's, uh, it's not in our Irishness to be able to deal with compliments or praise. I think we're very reflexive at deflecting that away. Um, so that's been a challenge. But um, I, I'm delighted. It's funny. I felt so detached from the book by the time it was published that... Um, it's, it's interesting to be witnessing people reading it for the first time when I was just living with it, with it for so long. Um, it's been an interesting journey, but I'm, I'm, I'm very proud and delighted. And tell us about that. Was there a big gap between when you went traveling and writing the book and actually when it was published? What was the time frame between the two? Yes. Yeah, so um, when I left, it was 2017 and I didn't really have a plan at all. I wasn't sure. I knew I was going to go for a year. I ended up going for two and a half. Um, and I think the idea for the book really kind of started to turn in my head around the last six months. Um, probably multiple reasons for that. I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. I kind of wanted to channel my energy into something uh, that felt a bit more solid um, and routine than the life I'd been living for the last number of years, which was just very kind of unfamiliar and unpredictable and a bit all over the place. Um, and also I needed an anchor, like I needed a reason to come home. Um, and I, I ultimately ended up coming home to go back to college. But prior to making that decision, the book was kind of what was starting to ease me in to the idea of coming home to maybe find a publisher and all of the rest of it. So I started to write it properly when I came home, which was um, June of 2019. And then it was published in, uh, I'm actually getting confused because of COVID. It was meant to be published in March, but it was actually pushed out to April of 2020. So yeah, it was like, it was about a year, um, about a year of solid work in the making. And why do you think so many people have associated with it and taken so much from it? I feel like, too close to that question to answer it but also like I have the privilege of speaking directly to the audience on a regular basis on social media so I can kind of answer on their behalf um what I'm getting from people is that I feel like they didn't expect what's in the book um I'm not sure what they expected because again I'm too close to it but I feel like maybe a more shallow story or maybe a more lovely fluffy story um, like this is my lovely life in a in a in a distilled down kind of also what I got was the expectation of it being badly written <laughs> uh, which has been a nice compliment people are like you can actually write um but I had always written so that wasn't I had always written kind of like uh, different columns and stuff like that over the years but maybe they had fallen on total deaf ears which seems to be the case um so I think yeah I think people expected it to be a bit of a dud um and maybe not to be quite as um honest as it is um but for me there was no other book to write like there was nothing else to say it was just it would have been puddle deep you know it wouldn't have been worth anyone's money or time or even my effort to it, it, that it took to write it the only way that that book felt worthy to me in what already felt like such a narcissistic pursuit and I was battling with it so much was that perhaps in this world of perfectness, it could be a, a permission slip, uh, one that I felt I needed probably a few years ago to, um, to look at the reality behind a lot of the, the, a lot of the um, prevalence of anxiety, you know? And the conversation around mental health was becoming louder and louder. People were speaking up more about struggling with depression or anxiety, but I was seeing absolutely not one person talk about the underlying reasons why that's the case and I think that that's because those things are cringe they're a bit socially taboo they're the things we don't air about ourselves they're the parts of ourselves that we don't want to talk about publicly 
if even personally. Um, and for me, I was like, hang on a minute. These are like universal human problems. For sure, people are going to be able to relate. And so that kind of became the purpose of the book was to kind of take the veil off those human parts of ourselves that we all feel a bit ashamed of, um, even though we shouldn't. Okay. And from reading the book, honest is a word I would certainly, or a stamp I would certainly put on it. It is an extremely honest account uh, of everything before the trip and everything during. It's incredibly so. Take me back to that pivotal moment on the M50. That's pretty much where it all kicked off. Uh, dark rainy day, something happened and that triggered the rest. Yeah, I mean, I had been struggling with anxiety for many months prior to that, but I had no idea what it was. Like I was a really productive person at that time and I was very bound to that identity. Um, and I didn't have time nor space for the problem of anxiety. So I would just kind of reframe it. Um, and I was always kind of treating the symptoms. So I'd go to the GP and I'd be like, look, I'm having heart palpitations. How do I deal with that? Or, you know, I was kind of just trying to put a little plaster on a bullet wound as I think how I referenced it in the book. Um, and of course that didn't work. So we all have within us a certain amount of coping mechanisms, a certain amount of coping skills. Um, but we also all have a certain a point where they are exhausted and where you know we kind of will lose that very socially put together front that we're able to maintain and just become erratic or irrational or emotionally dysregulated and, and maybe a bit out of character um, and I think in my youthful vigor I managed to kind of keep that veil together for about six months um, but that day on the M50 was kind of the um, the end of that ability to lie to myself my ability to go oh well I'm not sleeping because of this or I'm not eating because of this or I'm feeling unwell because of this or I have no energy because of that um and to just keep plodding along ticking off the to-do list on my google calendar every day and showing up for work and generating that last bit of fucking energy to get through a radio show and going home and crying for the evening and then telling myself it was because of whatever reason so that day it wasn't really the start. It was probably the end actually um, of, of my ability to keep ignoring what was happening. And, and at that point I just had to stop. Um, and I handed in my notice the following day. I actually still for many months after, and this sounds really probably unbelievable in hindsight, but I still really didn't think I was struggling with a mental health issue. Even at that point, you know, for many months after that, I still was like, I need a second opinion here. This is bullshit. Um, it was just so irrelevant to me. I had never known in my family, you know, I, it, to me at that time, this is what I was thinking. No one in my family has any problems. This is, you know, I was just like, nah, of course this isn't part of my script. Of course I'm not struggling with my mental health. Like there's give me the tablets, what's going on here. And um, so it took many months from, for the penny to drop. Um, and in all of that time, I was just slowly, uh, I was slowly slipping into the quicksand of burnout um, because no matter what you tell yourself, you don't have control over that. You know, your body is struggling and you have to listen, you have to tune in and listen. And I was doing everything but. And to many people looking in, you would have had, for want of a better word, the dream, uh, you know, from the outside in, in terms of the work, in terms of some TV, radio, modeling, there was lots of stuff going on that people would have, people would have seen it that would look like a dream lifestyle. Was that the goal uh, started? Was that something that you wanted to do? Were those, those jobs, things that you originally had wanted to do in life that you thought, okay, this is what I really want to do. This is going to bring me happiness. And were these, yeah. those are obviously things that you pursued that you wanted to try. Um, yeah, for sure. There was an element of that, but I think on the other hand, I was just doing what I was told. Do you know, um, I think I, I, I finished school and I knew I wasn't, I didn't have a really clear vision on what I wanted to do in terms of something like the CAO or is it the CEO? CAO, right? CAO, yeah. See, yeah. I, I didn't have a kind of a prescribed path in that way. I wasn't like, I want to be a vet or I want to be a nurse or I want to be a, you know, I didn't have that answer, but I did know that I wanted to be successful. You know, like I wanted to have a, a career. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to follow the prescribed benchmarked Irish path that you're meant to follow. 
Um, and so in a lot of ways, I kind of was just doing what I was told, even though I suppose it, it was slightly unconventional in that it was a media career. Um, but did I ever stop to think about why I was doing it or if it was authentic to me or if it was what I really wanted to do? Absolutely not. As soon as I kind of got my in, my foot in the door, I was doing what I think most people are doing in their own jobs in their own way, just pivoting for the next promotion, pivoting for the next step up the ladder. Um, and I was obviously somewhat good at that because I ended up getting, you know, a decade out of the modeling career and um, a breakfast radio show and all of the things that I thought would tick those boxes of um, contentment, you know, and really there was contentment to be found in none of it. I was just constantly dealing with a hum of exhaustion and anxiety because genuinely in a decade, I never once stopped not once to ask myself, do I like this? Is it in line with what I want? Where is it going? Am I happy? Like, you know, have I spent any time working on other aspects of myself? I was just, I had the blinkers on, you know, and that's not to say I didn't enjoy it. Like I loved it until I didn't. Okay. And then you hand in your notice. Oh, you ring your friends and family. What did they say when you told them? God, I wish it was that clean. I, I think it was much messier than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, as I said, I really did love so many aspects of the career. It was, it was really unconventional. I loved the um, uncertainty of it. And I know that's probably not uh, a regular thing to love. I think you know, there's lots to be said for certainty and safety and familiarity and all of that. And I just kind of loved the um, adrenaline that I got, even in the safety of the career, I still felt I got the adrenaline kick from it. But I didn't really know where I was going with it, as I said, and I didn't really know if I even really loved it in the end. Um, but when I handed in my notice, it wasn't any kind of brave, conscious decision. Like I didn't sit down and go, okay, now this is time. I was, I was utterly incapable of going to work. It was out of my hands at that point. And the decision was made for me. Like it was just not, it wasn't a possibility anymore. Um, as I said, I had completely exhausted my coping mechanism. Like I, I was, I, I do, I describe this as best I can in the pages of the book, but like, you know, my ability to take care of myself had really, I, I wasn't even showering. I, I was, barely eating um and that sounds probably quite drastic but it had happened so slowly oh it, it had disintegrated so slowly over such a long period of time that it did it wasn't one day I was this way and the other day I was this way it had happened so insidiously that I almost hadn't noticed and then it was just numb that's how I would describe it it was like one day I was managing to kind of lie to myself and the next day I was just utterly numb. Um, and so I didn't really have that really clear mindset of, okay, I'm going to hand in my job. I'm going to tell my family. It was just, uh, you know, I, I was kind of just taking baby steps. I did hand in my notice. Um, I'm sure I did tell my family. I don't think I, re I recall that conversation though. Um, and I just paired my life back to absolute minimal. So at that point, everything felt, felt very overstimulating. Like even just going outside the door felt really overstimulating. So I was just going to twice weekly therapy. I was trying my best to do some of these mindfulness practices that I had no idea about at the time, like meditation and yoga. And I hated them all. Um, and I moved home eventually to my, to my family home. And uh, I think a lot of people probably wanted me to kind of stay there and cocoon and work on getting better but I just didn't want to do that at all so you grabbed a backpack and that that was this and that was the that was the solution or that was the answer potentially yeah I, it was about three months of after I handed in my notice before I left to go traveling no I lie it was three months of working out my 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 notice which was a really difficult time actually because I just didn't have it anymore I really didn't have that capacity but I had a contract and I had to um and I also wasn't speaking openly about it was I didn't say oh I'm struggling Do you know I just 
because as I said, I didn't even believe it at that time myself. I was still very, very, in, I was in the murky waters of it. Um, I didn't have that clarity. This is all hindsight. Um, and then once I worked out that leave, I had about three months where I did pair my life back and I was just doing therapy and lots of different things. Um, and the reason I chose to go traveling, even though it was a very counterintuitive thing to do age 29, when you're, uh, being prescribed, um, antidepressants and, you know, every type of, uh, pill and, I don't know, I can't even remember what they were telling me to do at that time. It was very counterintuitive to to be vulnerable like that, to be a girl on your own at a time when people are generally settling down, settling into their career, to walk away from the decade of work, to walk away from medical advice, to walk away from uh, the security of your family, to travel on your own. Um, but the reason I did it was, um, I mentioned that I felt like so predominantly numb and it was just such a really predominant feeling. Um, actually it was numbness and nerves. That's all I ever felt all the time was just, there was no joy in anything anymore. And the only little spark of aliveness that I felt at all ever was when I thought about going traveling. And so it felt like the most obvious thing in the world to me, even though it was probably a little bit mad to anyone else around me who cared at that time. It wasn't even a scary choice at all. People like say to me, was it scary? Like, were you nervous? Not at all. I couldn't have got on that plane quicker because it was so scary, the thought of staying at home and the thought of staying locked in that mindset I was in, in my childhood bedroom, trying to figure it out. And this is not a universal remedy. You know, I don't think that this is the right way, but it was, it was the first time in such a long time that I probably tuned into myself, trusted myself, listened to my authentic whatever was coming up for me um so it was my remedy and it wasn't even that it wasn't even that certain at the time it was just so lovely to feel a sense of like um non-synthetic uh happiness you know okay so to feel alive traveling was the one thing that made you feel alive and authentic and real the thought of it. Yeah. The thought of it. And then when I left, it freaked the shit out of me because I was like, because I had put all my eggs in that basket, like this was my savior now. Then I thought, Oh, what if it isn't, you know? And then I spent so many months kind of stopping myself from getting started. Um, and, and doing lots of very, again, counterintuitive and stupid numbing things. Um, and really just, hopping from safety net to safety net really not getting started on the travel um and a lot of just numbing um because I think I was really scared then when I left that maybe I was wrong that I was never scared of the travel I was scared that it wouldn't be the salvation I was looking for and that this mindset I'd gotten into is just the mindset I'd be in on the road as well and that I was that I had just completely um misjudged this um and that maybe I'd made a really stupid decision um that was the fear more than more than the fear of leaving or the fear of traveling as a girl on my own or anything like that and when you sat on the plane did you have a, a mind map or a map for how those two years were going to look or how the 12 months were going to look were there places that you had plans to go and see or was it let's go and just escape and see what happens i hadn't when i look back now i hadn't the, the foggiest of i hadn't i had no idea when i was coming back um, I had no idea where I was going. I had a really vague, but even when I think, even when I think, I don't even think I did have a vague plan. I tell myself I did now, but when I look at my travel route, I didn't, it was so convoluted. I was like up and down and it wasn't even linear. Do you know? I was like, I'd fly here and then I'd fly there and then I'd fly there and then fly. like, it was a mess. Um, so I really don't think I did have any kind of solid plan in place. I think I knew I just had to go. Um, and then I was figuring it out day by day as I went. And something I get asked a lot is, you know, how did you go and travel for that long? Um, and I never, I'm always conscious of the fact that it's such a privilege that I was able to to do that and such a privilege that I could, you know, you know, even, even in talking about 
making the decision um, and that it, it was, you know, maybe not necessarily the, the easiest thing or the easiest choice to make at that time in your life. It's still such a fucking privilege, you know, to, to find yourself in that uh, place where you can afford to take that step back. Um, and yeah, I always want to kind of um, just acknowledge that and recognize it. Um, and I don't know if I did at the time, but I do in hindsight, um, you know, I had, I had a certain amount of savings that I probably should have put towards a house or something much more, um, you know, certain for my future, but I, I chose to, to travel instead. And to be honest now, I wouldn't change a minute of it, but at that time, um, I, yeah, I don't know if I was thinking like that, you know, I don't know if I was, I, I probably should have looked at those savings and went, right, that's for a mortgage. But it was, none of that was relevant to me at that time. It was just trying to keep my head above the water. And in terms of the trip, and you know, and there's lots of this in the book, obviously that people can read about further, but was there, was there one particular time or one particular moment which gave you that sense of belonging, that sense of alive that you were searching for when you left? Was there one or two particular moments that really delivered that or was it a sense of the overall trip delivered it? Yeah, um, I've been asked that question like quite a few times and I'd love if, if I could hinge it beautifully on two like really <laughs> poetic, gorgeous moments. And I wish that life was like that, but like usually the truth is so messy and so not straightforward and it's never a linear thing. It's always a fucking mess to get to where you're going. And, and then we can package it up lovely in hindsight again as always. But so no is the, is the honest answer, but in hindsight, yes. When I look back, I can definitely see certain moments and some of them are so trivial. It's mad. Some of them f didn't feel like anything at the time, but when I look back, I could see how important they were. But in the moment at the time, no, nothing felt like a moment of enlightenment or a moment of um, oh, I get it now, or I feel better. It's only, it's only when I look back after all of the tiny baby steps forward with 10 steps back in between and another baby step forward. It's only, it's only after all of the work that I can look back and see those moments clearly, but at the time, no. But um, some, of the, some of the initial moments, well, first of all, the thing that I think helped the most was just creating that time creating that space, removing myself from the mindless routine of my day-to-day -day life. And I don't mean that it was mindless in what I was doing. It was very productive, but I mean, like it had become so normal that there was no space for anything new. I knew the routine of my day most days. So when I kind of removed all of that, all of a sudden it was just me and an empty day. And so having that space was the initial it was half the problem because it was like, you know, you have to then deal with that decision, but it also created a certain amount of room that I'd never had to, to think, to read, to sit with myself, to uh, write, to do new things, to get to know myself again. Um, and it was like, probably, as I mentioned, the trivial things like sitting on really long bus journeys and having to um, deal with my own mind when my phone had died. Um, and you know, things you never have to do and you're always busy at home. You're always busy. It's like, go, go, go. You never have to sit with that authentic discomfort. There's always a way to numb it. Just pick up your phone and you're, you no longer are in your mind. You're anywhere in the world. Um, so it was those kind of trivial things that then led to bigger things because once I started to introspect or to self-examine, even if it was completely unconscious and, and somewhat forced by the scenario, it then started to alter my behavior slightly and, and the decisions I was making and the places I was going and the things I was doing and all of those things incrementally built very slowly into an insight that I was definitely lacking. So again, sorry that that answer is not so poetic and I wish I could just say it was at the top of a mountain and it, it was snow capped and a guru was there and he said to me, <laughs> no, it wasn't that. Yeah, you know, in all fairness, it's something that we've seen with guests who we have chatted about on the podcast, not with similar stories. They haven't traveled traveled for that long, but it comes back to finding your real self or finding your true self. And that doesn't happen overnight. That happens over time. 
yeah. and, 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 and doing that kind of introversion. Um, one of the things we're, ch- we're chatting with Jerry Hussey about it in terms of, you know, the authentic self. And sometimes you find parts of yourself that you might like or that you do like. Do you have moments like that? And I've done it myself. I found parts of my own personality that I didn't like either. But did you have moments where you find that you said, oh, I don't like that about myself or, you know, and how do you handle that? I think it's interesting for our listeners to be able to get an insight into, into, into that. Absolutely. Like one of the most interesting things for me was, and I don't know if this is culturally ingrained or if it's just part of the human condition, but it's so interesting to me that there's a spectrum of human emotion, right? Like if you're out in a restaurant and you see somebody laughing, no one would bat an eyelid. No one would turn. No one feels uncomfortable. If you're out in a restaurant and you see someone crying, it's innately uncomfortable and socially taboo. It's not acceptable, even though it is a perfectly healthy, perfectly normal human emotion. So the spectrum of emotion that we're taught to accept about ourselves and to be acceptable to others is like half of the things. You know, you can be happy, you can be this, that, and the other. But if you're angry or you're ashamed or you're embarrassed or you're jealous those parts of ourselves even though they are us they just do not appear on the script of who we are and we develop really well-oiled ways of getting out of sitting with them like we have social scripts we develop phobias we quite literally tell ourselves a different story we just they're just not part of who we are but yet they are they're they're part of who all of us are and when you sit and and um self-examine of course they come up they come up and not only do they come up and are there they also are a huge driver behind a lot of the um behaviors and choices that we make and a lot of the reflexive thought that we have i would say probably even more powerful than our positive emotions um, and so when you come to that realization and you, and you kind of accept that a lot of who you are is driven by the parts of yourself that you completely deny and ignore, it's slightly unsettling. In fact, when you really go into it, the actual word that I always come back to is harrowing because it's like taking off a mask. Like you have this version of yourself that you have decided upon and that's comfortable. And then when that gets destabilized, it's not a nice experience. If it was a nice experience, there'd be no work to do. We'd all just have done it already. Um, so did I come across parts of myself I didn't like? Absolutely. In fact, I think the book in itself is an examination of that and that's why it's uncomfortable. Um, it's, a, it's a here is the parts of myself I found that I didn't like and they're in all of us and that's okay. But yet, why are we never told it's okay? Because you cannot be what you can't see. You know, that's so cliche. That's not my words. But like, you, you literally can't, you know, there's just, there's just a whole aspect of ourselves that no one's talking about. How are we supposed to learn and grow collectively if it's not part of the conversation? And at what point did you think, okay, it's time to pack up my bags, jump on the plane and get home? What was the, what was the, the, the moment? Still of- struggling with that. No. <laughs> um, well, I'd been gone for two and a half years and um, I only had a certain amount of savings. Now, you know, I had, I had enough to probably have kept going for even longer. But with that said, um, the lifestyle is not easy. Do you know, it's not easy to live out of a bag. It's not easy to travel long term. And actually, I fucking loved it, if I'm being totally honest. I loved the simplicity. I loved the lack of pressure. I loved the um, complete removal from like commercialism as a whole and like having to have this look like this. Um, And I was, I was, I still struggle and I did dread coming back into that lifestyle, into that society where that's so prevalent. You know, like, especially me as a young woman, it feels like sometimes you're only valuable if you have beautiful makeup and you can do a tutorial on how you did it or, um, you know, or you have a curated gorgeous wedding and, uh, you know, a, a, a photogenic like family or, you know what I mean? It just feels like there's so much pressure to be a catalog life. And I just was so disinterested in that. And it felt so inauthentic and forced. And I was so, scared 
to come home to that and to come home to all of the things that had triggered me and that I had left on unfinished. But also in not facing that, that's a huge cop out because that's life. This is where I'm from. This is where I'm always going to be from. And yeah, okay, I can go and live on some island and never, but that's not right either. You know, that's, that's running in another way. And I think I realized that, that you have to make your peace with who you are and where you are. So you can be authentic, you can be yourself um, and you can live in a place that not necessarily uh, aligns with that at all times. But isn't that, isn't that living your truth? Isn't that living your authenticity? Isn't that actually trusting yourself you know, living by your values, not being swayed by social pressures and things like that. So ultimately I came home for a multitude of reasons. One, I think I realized that I had to, and that it was just another form of running if I didn't. Two, I didn't have a completely um, endless bank account, even though I was thinking I could probably figure out some remote way of working, but I was like, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go home. And uh, thirdly, I realized as well when I was traveling that, um, I really wanted a new career path and um, it became really obvious to me what I wanted to do. And so I chose to go back to college and that for me was the real, uh, okay, I'm going home. Do you know, I was like, I want to go back. Um, I'm doing four years of psychotherapy now in DBS. Um, I've just finished uh, my first year of four and it felt like, it felt like reason to go home. Okay, so you found you found your your your, your meaning for want of a better word in your path, and you came home yeah. to start it, which is great. And now you have a best selling book to add to the list. Yeah, uh, tell us, remind us the name of the book and where people can. It's available in all good bookstores, I presume. Yes, it's in all the bookstores, and it's online on the book depository and Amazon with free shipping worldwide for all the Irish abroad who've been amazing. I never knew how many of us there were everywhere. Um, and also it's on Kindle. It's out on Audible on September 1st. It's called Jump. And uh, it's, it's about all of the things that we've just talked about, uh, plus so much more in there as well. I really, really tried to have not one filler page in that book, like no filler. I was like, I'd rather it be this size and every word is quality than to have some kind of like segue bridge of nonsense from one story to another. So I'm so grateful to everyone who's picked up a copy and I never for one second took for granted that it takes time out of someone's day. And I hope it's a, I hope it's an entertaining read an escapism read. I hope it's a, a worthy read and that people get something out of it. Um, and it was such a privilege to write it. So yeah. Well, thank you so much for giving us an insight into your trip. I've read the book. It is fantastic. And it's been great to chat to you. You interviewed me many, many, many years ago. And I'm delighted to be able to return the, uh, the favourite interview on The Real Health. So thank you so much for joining us. Much appreciated, Danielle Moyles. We shall see you soon in the future and mind yourself. Folks, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. As ever, you know where we are at Carl Henry PT on Twitter and on Instagram. If you have any questions, just email them into us realhealth at independent.ie. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode and we'll see you next week for more Real Health podcasts. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.